Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered, still in quarantine, obviously. Today, I have a very special guest and a very special announcement. My guest is Brooke Christian. She is the founder of Sexy as a Mother, which is a platform for sex and motherhood, two things that I think most people don't think about going together, but Brooke is all about that. So Brooke, welcome. And please tell us a little bit more about what you do. Yeah. So I run a platform, whatever you want to call it, um, a place where you can talk about sex and motherhood, because what happens when you have a child, your sex life sort of, it goes nuclear, right? Like there are so many changes that happen in your world, in your relationship, in your relationship to yourself, like sex, your kids. It's just a bomb. And nobody really talks about that. But so many moms, I have yet to meet a mother that's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So like, we all sort of understand that. And so, you know, I write about that on my own blog and other blogs. I, um, I sell really high end curated sex toys that are selected with moms in mind, right? Like our needs are very different than someone who has four hours to like indulge their S and M and like do fire play. Like we don't have that kind of luxury. So, um, and I also sort of help moms understand that we can be sexy as moms. Like we, we can be sexy and moms at the same time, you know, Mm -hmm. like we can be two people because what happens is moms go through an identity crisis and those two women, the sexy woman and the mom, she can still be in you. So how do we navigate that? So it's a lot of tips and tricks and all that good stuff. Um, I too have a podcast called sexy as a mother, where we talk to moms about, um, all of these things. And sometimes I just pontificate on bad sex I had last night when my daughter walked in, you know, like all of these kinds of things. But um, it's a forum for conversation about stuff that people don't really talk about. So how old are your kids? So I have a 10 year old in fourth grade and a six and a half year old in first grade. And um, it's for real up in here in quarantine. Like it is not a joke at all. <laughs> and actually, my son is actually um, spectrum. So he's like very high functioning autism and mm. he's great, but like he has different needs, you know, like he can't approach school the same way that other kids do. So that's a whole pile on. It's really fun. I'm having the best time ever. <laughs> <laughs> so if You guys are wondering why I'm having someone like Brooke on um, when normally I just, you know, generally have people from the adult industry on. I'm trying to expand my guest repertoire. I really want to have more educators on, just people who talk about sex in different ways. And I thought Brooke was, you know, a great opportunity for that. But also this is the perfect time for me to make my big announcement, which I feel like probably a lot of you have sort of guessed by now, um, I'm pregnant and I am 14 weeks and I am due in mid-October. So that's, (laughs) it's a pretty crazy life-changing situation. So when Brooks publicist actually approached me, I was like, what a perfect time to not only have somebody on that kind of just bring some more diversity and variety to my show, but also like what a perfect opportunity for me to utilize your time to ask you all the questions that I have as a, you know, um, coming up new mother. So yeah. Fire away, girl. Congratulations. Thank you. Buckle Thank you. up. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy. So um, I am 41 and I honestly, you know, I, I grew up always thinking that I wanted kids. And then, um, I don't know, like I was married for a while and then we got divorced. And I think when that marriage ended, I kind of came to this conclusion that maybe like kids weren't in the cards for me because 
I, I don't know, like this whole idea that I always had that like I was going to have children kind of felt different to me after that divorce. So um, I got, I, m- I met somebody else, my, my current husband and, you know, he's amazing and we have such a great life together, but I just, I think by the time we got together, you know, I was in this fear of being too old to have kids. Cause you know how they say like yeah, after totally. like 30 or 35, it becomes more difficult. And, and so, and I'd never been pregnant before. So I think, um, you know, people would ask like, are you trying? And I, I would say we're not not trying. We would. Like, it's would, so annoying when people ask that question, especially like, when it's your mother. Oh, like, all the, all the like, time. So gross, mom. You know how babies are made. Don't ask me that question. <laughs> it's so gross. So um, yeah. So I think I didn't want to try try because then I might fail, yeah, and if I failed. Sure that would be really disappointing. So I thought if I don't ever really try, then I won't fail. So um, my husband plays hockey. So basically what we did was we just removed the goalie from the net. Pull the goalie. Pull the goalie. (laughs) And we're just like, we'll see what happens. And, um, you know, like we did that a couple of years ago. And yeah, I, I, I conceived in January. So it's really exciting and kind of unexpected, but we're, we're so thrilled. That's amazing. So and you, we were saying off camera that you feel great, which yes, bow down to you, girl. Super bow lucky. Down. I've had zero morning sickness. Um, I do feel tired at times, to- like more tired at times. I definitely go to bed earlier. Um, one thing that does kind of plague me a little bit is that I tend to get like itchy if I don't wear really soft clothes. Mm. I'm a lot more sensitive to, mm-hmm. to fabrics. And sometimes my legs get kind of achy at night if I'm trying to sleep. But besides that, I feel fine. So awesome. I yeah. wish you nothing but continuation of that. <laughs> Thank you. And so I find myself in this situation that I know a lot of people in my industry are in where how do you you know, cause I work in the adult industry and my business is around sex and, and I'm going to have a child and, and I personally feel fairly confident in raising my child and continuing to work in this industry just because my mom, she was, you know, she raised me in this industry. That's how I got in this thing was my parents. So, you know, I, I come from a long line of pornographers. <laughs> um, so I'm not Jeez really history. worried. Yeah. So I'm not really, you know, terribly worried about that, but you know, there are those, those questions of like, when do you talk to your kids about sex? And, yeah. and I think what, what you specialize in and the idea of losing my sexual identity in becoming a mother. So maybe tell me a little bit about your journey and why you got into, you know, what you do and, and was there like a tipping point that made you realize that you needed to help other people with this? There was totally a tipping point. I mean, I had had this like really great, very Carrie Bradshaw life in New York city. I worked at Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and in style. And I was like the girl catching cabs with my arm up, you know, my Jimmy shoes. Like I had this really fabulous life. And then I became a mom and I lived in the suburbs and I was like, this is not at all what I signed up for. And by the time I had my second, I got slammed with like very severe postpartum depression, like suicidal. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. That scares me. I've heard a lot about that. So you didn't have it with your first one, but you had it with your I had what's called postpartum anxiety, PPA, which is much less known. And it was on, it was like retroactively diagnosed, right? So like in hindsight, it became clear that's what I had. But when I had my son, I was just like slayed. And so my like postpartum recovery, meaning like that whole year, because you really need like a year was just pretty terrible. And I still, I, I was just like, you know what? I'm on pills, which I got sh- no shame in that game. I'm in therapy, like things are good, but I'm going to take it to the next level and I need to feel good about myself. And this is no judgment on anyone else and how they view themselves, but I wanted to lose weight. Like I wanted to look like how I did before kids. So I did that and I was feeling really good about myself. And so by six months later, I did a boudoir photo shoot and, 
you know, the thing about boudoir is everyone thinks they're doing it for their partner, but they're actually doing it for themselves, right? Like it's this yeah. entirely empowering situation. And I was I've there. Done a, I've done a couple of those. So right? Was- like you just feel so badass, like when you're yeah. doing it, you know, you think you're going to be nervous, but then you wind up being this like Phoenix rising. And it's like this crazy thing. And so I was sitting there with like, you know, Bridget Bardot hair and garters and like stilettos. And I was like, I am so fucking sexy. Like this is cray cray. And I went home and I had the most amazing sex with my husband ever. No toys at that point. And so I started to like harness that side of myself. I started to flirt with my husband more. I started to wear more lingerie. And I was like, it was like this feeding cycle, you know, like this snowballing thing. And so a couple months later, my husband brought home a cock ring. We had never used toys before. And he brings home the Juju Mio cock ring, which like comes in this gorgeous box and so classy and so beautiful. So we have sex with this thing. And sex before the cock ring was literally like analog television. Like that, and then sex with the cock ring was like IMAX 4D, Star Wars, you know, lightsabers in your face. I was like, what were we having before? Because if this is what sex is, I want to have it all the time. (laughs) Can you you explain the difference? Like, Um, it took me a lot longer to orgasm. Like, it was like a total crapshoot. Like, maybe every 30 times I would come. Um, I realized that I was doing it for his pleasure, really, and not for mine. Like, I wasn't getting even half out of it as what he was. And then I would get like resentful. And then I found myself like just trying to finish him so that it could be over. Right. Oh yeah. And then, I think yeah, all women exactly. know what we, that's we've like. all done that. And I'm faking yeah. it. And like, yeah. you know, sometimes it would be lovely, you know, but more often than not, it was like, wah, wah, you know? And so then when I had sex with this cock ring, which essentially was, is vibrating and it has this huge head. And so it, it hits up against your clit every time you guys are connecting. And all of a sudden I was like, oh shit, this is way better than my finger, right? On my clit. And I had like four orgasms, like real deep, crazy orgasms from penetration. And I'm not a G-spot girl, right? Like I'm a click girl. And so this was mind blowing. I felt closer to my husband. I was like, wow, okay. I can come from sex. This is amazing. You know, like I found a tool. And so what wound up happening is I went to like a mommy and me class where I had all my mom friends and like, I'm the person who like, just like, I don't care. So like, I just say stuff like, and I'm also the type of person who could turn anything sexual. Like you could be like, I had a yogurt today and I'd be like, it was a trippy. Like I can make <laughs> anything sexual. So right. I go to mommy and me with like all my little mom friends. And I'm like, do you know about this Cochrane? you know about this thing? And like, we're shaking maracas, like with our babies. And I'm like, it's amazing. Like you've come (laughs) four times. Like, and I'm going like that. And they, um, they all bought it. You know, they all went online and they bought it just like you would, if your girlfriend said, I found this amazing mascara or this, you know, amazing lipstick. Right. And they all came back and were like, Oh, 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 that was amazing. You know? And so, and they started to have sex with their husbands more and they had like a little, like, shaking their hips. And it just, I saw their lives turn around, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that there was an underserved market here, that Mm -hmm. moms weren't having this conversation about how hard this is. And moms didn't know what the solutions were. And they Mm -hmm. didn't want a porn star to tell them. They didn't Mm -hmm. want to take recommendations from a porn star. They wanted to take recommendations for someone who was living the same like joy and nightmare. Right. So, right. That's what I started. Somebody that could relate to the position that they were in. Correct. Correct. Because I mean, to be fair, like porn stars live in a world of sex. Their job is sex. So like that's everything they do as a mom, like your job is like your child and whatever else you do. Correct. And it's just the challenges. There's so much emotion that comes with being a mom. It is like the best and the worst right? Like you just have so much emotion tied up in it. Like here's this human that like, you've never cared about anything in your life more than this human, but it has robbed you of a lot of things. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, 
the challenges are different than a single person or just a, you know, a, a married person or a coupled person. And the truth is, if you're not living that life, if you're not in that and understand that you're going to get cocked blocked by stomach flow, like that somebody is going to like walk in on you and you're going to have to have some weird explanation or that you literally have three minutes to have sex, like you're not, you need someone to trust, right? Like you just need someone to trust. And these moms trust me, which is everything. And I don't take that lightly, like at all, because this is vulnerable. This is really vulnerable stuff. Yeah. So do you ever come across women who feel like any guilt exploring the side of themselves? Like as a mom, do you have that idea that you feel like you have to give everything your whole life, every part of your being to your child and being a mom and that like even taking a small sliver of your life for yourself and for sex is something that like should be shamed. Do you experience that? Oh my God. I mean, that's why I say you can be both things, right? It's this Mary, you know, and the whore kind of like complex that happens. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we, you know, women become moms, they think they can no longer be sexy because that is slutty and whorish, right? Mm -hmm. Like that part of themselves is dead because it's Mm -hmm. inappropriate. You know, like it's not okay. You know, society is going to scarlet letter them and they're going to be labeled and they're like, it's just that part's done. And now I am just Mother Teresa. You know, like now I am just kindergarten teacher for everybody all the time. And that happens a lot. And some of the things I hear the most are, I used to be. I used to be, I used to be, I used to be. Mm. But now I can't. But now I can't. Used to be and can't or no longer. Like those are the two words. And so it's about bringing women back into the idea that like you are multidimensional, like Mm -hmm. you're not just one thing, but you have to work for it. You know, like Mm -hmm. to your point that there's guilt and taking, you know, there's so much conversation in the mommy zeitgeist about self-care, take time for Mm -hmm. your manicure, take time for your yoga, take time for a bath. Like there's so much of that and it's all true. Sex needs to be lumped into that. Like you need mm. to add, add sex to that, I believe, whether with yourself or a partner, like, or, you know what, orgasm needs to be added to that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I yeah. You need to add orgasm to that. Yeah. Um, but there is a ton of guilt because you've got a kid being like, mommy, I miss you. Mommy, don't go. Mommy, my, you know, and you're like, heart's dying. But mm-hmm. we have to do it. And so I try yeah. to help women not have shame, not have guilt. And so I try to live my life a little bit more out loud because I try to be an example, right? Like I try to, well, look at me. You don't have a problem with me doing it. So why do you have a problem with you doing it? It's okay. Like I give you permission. You know what moms need? We need permission. Mm -hmm. Like we need permission to be more than just a mom. So I hope I give that to other moms. I think this also like kind of leans into a problem that a lot of women face that, you know, we can only be one thing and we can't be multidimensional. This is something that we explore in a different way a lot in the conversations that I have with porn stars, you know, where they're like, well, I can only be a sexual person. I can't also be like an intellectual person. I also, I can't also be a creative person. Like society will only let me be this one thing. And then they've like, they're like, okay, she's a porn star. She's a whore. Like nothing she says matters. Her opinion doesn't matter. Right. Right. That kind of thing. And so I I see when you're saying this, that the same kind of dynamic is, is being lent to mothers, but in obviously in a completely different way, like you're a mom and that's all you are. And that's your entire life's purpose. And, um, that's the only thing that should matter to you. Um, when I think that it, sends a much healthier message to your children. If, you know, that's the, the one thing that you're really concerned about as a mother, which I assume one is, um, that loving yourself and taking time for yourself and valuing yourself and all these other, um, dimensions of yourself is, is a good thing to make you a well-rounded person and a happy person. And I, I think that's a great message to give your children. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my older one, my 10 year old is a girl and she is keen on this, right? Like Mm. she's seen over the past six years when I started to become like very verbal and um, 
sort of my own activist about taking time for myself, like breaks and mommy and daddy are having date night. And, you know, like, no, our door is closed right now. You may not come in. You are not invited. Like all these things. No, you may not come with me for my manicure. Like making all these hard lines. Now that she's entering sort of her preteen years, she is asking for her own privacy and her own timeouts and like her own breaks. And I give them to her very freely. And like, it's kind of like she understands now why I was doing that and has more empathy about it. And so I hope I've given, I think I've given her a good lesson, you know, like I, I, that is an example I want to set. And Yeah. I mean, I imagine porn stars have the same sort of thing. I mean, it's just unfair society wise to label anyone as one thing. Like none of us are like that. It's sex is particularly polarizing. As you know, it is Mm. particularly, um, you know, filled with, you know, judgment and shame and all of these things. And, you know, I see my job as helping women be more, right? To be more than just that one person, but show them how, like show them how in a way that is not shameful, right? Because like what I'll say is I think people have this idea of, well, if I'm going to be a sexy mom, then I'm going to roll up to drop off in my, you know, high heels and my short skirt and like my boobs sticking out. Like that, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, if that's how you roll, great. But like, that's not what I'm saying. You know, like, it's okay to show up looking homeless to drop off if you, yeah. you know, and look hot on your date with your partner. Like, that's okay. Those two women exist. Like, let's just let the second one out of the closet. Like, right. she's there. Let's just let them out. And so I, I try to let women know, like, I'm not saying that you need to be you know, making out with your husband at the family barbecue. Like that's not like what I'm suggesting, but, you know, maybe send him a flirty text while you're there that no one else can see and sort of get primes for when the kids go to bed that night. Like those types of things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, obviously I'm sure that you've helped a lot of women who have thanked you for the inspiration that you've given them. But I wonder if, uh, are you thanked, um, a lot by the, the husbands? So this is my favorite (laughs) thing ever. My favorite thing ever is to talk to husbands. Like I, I like want to just be invited to as many like men retreats or like male things like as humanly possible to like give Mm -hmm. speeches because it is the best thing ever. First of all, um, men will tell their wives, spend as much money with her as you want, like as many sex toys as you want to buy. Like there's no limit. <laughs> like here's my credit card. Um, and, and they also, um, I don't know that they thank me. I mean, they do thank me for sure, but I think what they thank me for is the, is the ability to have the conversation. You know, Mm. thank you for having that conversation with my wife. Thank you for having that conversation. Thank you for telling me how my wife feels, you know, thank Mm. you for explaining what I'm doing wrong or like why what I'm doing isn't working, you know, because there's Mm -hmm. always like an emotional reason for a woman, why that's not working like for a mom, you know, and the guys Mm. just don't see it that way. So yeah, I get thanked by them a lot. Um, but I, I think more than educating moms, I probably educate the husbands more. Mm. because they're like just so out of touch with what's happening, you know? Right. So it's more about educating them. And then once they apply it or their wife's applying what I've said, then like, yeah. So I have, it's this like funny joke in our family that, you know, most date nights are on Saturdays, like for most, you know, moms and married mm-hmm. couples, like whatever. So if I'm giving someone advice, like this is how you should roll a date night or they're starting to use a brand new toy that I recommended or whatever. Sunday morning, like my phone will blow up with my clients. Like that was the best thing I'd ever. Oh my God. I had the craziest orgasm or like the husband's texting me and my husband who hates it when I use my phone, which is comedy considering I like run a social media channel, but um, right. <laughs> he's like, it's hilarious. He's like, is your phone blowing up from date night? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Like, like so joke. like Sunday is like one of those days where all that feedback's just yeah, like rolling in for you. Totally. And my DMs, like, and my mm. Instagram DMs. Um, yeah. Full of love letters over the weekend for sure. 
<laughs> For sure. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back. We're talk a little bit more about um, what moms can do to feel sexy, what I can do to feel sexy because I don't. <laughs> and <laughs> And so much more. So hang out, guys. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, so we're back. So I, I do, can I ask you a little bit about more about postpartum depression? Cause you kind of totally. touched on that. And I mentioned totally. to you earlier that that is something I'm pretty fearful of. I find that I am a pretty even keel person. I don't have like a lot of crazy mood swings, even now, like with all the hormonal changes that are happening, I'm still like pretty even, um, you know, I don't take, I don't take anything. I, uh, but I'm concerned because I've heard from people like my, strangely enough, my sister-in-law is also pregnant and she's due like in a month. And one of her best friends who same as me is like pretty even temperament. Most of the time, you know, pretty like happy. She had a kid and had like insane postpartum depression, like suicidal, like that kind of thing. So it just seems like such an incredibly foreign thing to happen to you. And what an, what a bizarre, what a bizarre biological like result of having a child. Like how does that work in the theory of evolution where like you have a child, you have, you're procreating, you're continuing the human race and you it's, need to like take care of this thing. And you just like want to die. Like what the fuck? I've never honestly thought of it that way, but hashtag like you nailed it. Like, yes. Like why? It's like an why? appendix. Why? Like, why do you exist? Like, it doesn't make sense. No. Um, yeah, I look, I, I'm a truth teller. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'm going to say. Um, I pray for you that it does not happen. Um, but I rightfully scared. It's scary. Um, I think the benefit now is that there's a lot of conversation about it. There are a lot more resources. There's a lot more awareness. When I got it um, almost seven years ago, nobody talked about it. I didn't even know, like, it wasn't even like really labeled, you know, like I, I kind of knew maybe it was going to happen, but I wasn't sure. Um, when I, it was an out of body experience. It's mm. like. I didn't even know who I was and I didn't want to kill. I mean, I didn't want to harm my child or my children in any way. Right. I just wanted to, to leave, but like leave this earth, like leave it all. Like I mm -hmm. just wanted darkness. And so I would sit in closets because it was dark. Like, and I just oh. wanted to like close it down. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to take my passport and just go to the airport and like pick like Marrakesh. Like how far from here can I go? Um, and it was really scary because this wasn't who I was. I didn't have diagnosed depression. I didn't have that. Like 
I thought I was a really happy person. Like I had a really great life and I was, um, what I thought was normal. Um, but I knew by the time I came home with him that this was very wrong. Like I knew something was very, very wrong. Um, so it was like instant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was instant with my daughter too. Like it was mm. a lot of like, with, I, I just couldn't stop worrying. I was like, I just couldn't stop. I, I couldn't handle it. Like you have triggers. It tends to be when you have postpartum depression, you have triggers, right? Like something mm. that will really dive you in and crying was a trigger for me. Now, Babies cry. They cry nonstop. <laughs> they cry yeah, all yeah. the time. Um, and it's a cruel world that your postpartum peaks at six weeks, which is also when baby's fussiness peaks. So you've got like two things happening concurrently that do not help each other at all, um, which is tough. And that's when my friends found me. Um throwing up from anxiety and in a dark corner while my baby was crying. And they found me and immediately called my doctor and they called my husband. And here's the crazy part, you know, like they, they need to assess whether you should go to the hospital, you know, emergency room and all this stuff. And they, my never forget my, my best friend from childhood calls my husband and says, we have like a big problem here. I've already called her OB, you know, blah, blah, blah. And my husband says, what are you talking about? He had no idea. No. Wow. Like he knew I was having a hard time, but he just thought like, well, everyone has a hard time with a newborn. Like, and I have, he has a great, and he was great. Like he, I mean, I breastfed, so we couldn't feed him, but like he would change diapers and like rock him. And like, so I think he thought like, well, I'm helping a ton. She's just like, it's just hard. Yeah. And, I, and that for me was a huge moment. Cause I was like, I really am totally alone. Like mm -hmm. in this, I am totally alone. And mm -hmm. from that point on, um, there was no choice. I had to be medicated. Like I, there was no choice. I could not have, I was non-functioning. It was non-functioning. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I had to go on medication to save my own life. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew how I was going to kill myself. I was going to run my car into a tree when my kids were home with my husband. Like I, I knew how I was doing all of it, but it just – it's this horrible fog that creeps in. It's like, that's the only way I can describe it. It like, you know, sort of like gathers and then starts to fill and you can see it coming and you're like, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. And some women get it and some women don't and they have no idea why. It's like mm. playing craps. Like you have no idea. But all I tell women is you have to raise your hand. The second you feel like something's not right, like I, I don't have a connection to my baby, I'm crying all the fucking time, don't want to get out of bed, like, you know, whatever they are, um, you have to raise your hand. Like you have to, you have to say, if you don't want to tell your husband, call your OB, like you have to say, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. Because there's so much pressure on new moms to be like, I'm fine. I'm fine this. Look, I got my baby body back in six weeks and I'm doing an Us Weekly cover. Like, and I'm totally great. And I'm like out in my chaser sweatpants, like at the farmer's market, like with my baby. Isn't this so great? Don't my highlights look good? And you're like dying in a corner, you know, like there's this yeah. horribly unrealistic expectation. Um, and so that's why I always tell women, like, raise your hand because it's not weird that you are struggling. You should be struggling. This is hard. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do have to say, along with all the other societal pressures that we as women face to be like beautiful all the time and perfect and able to juggle a career and, you know, a perfect so fit body and a great diet and exercise regime. It makes me crazy when I see those, those magazine articles, like in us where it's like, you know, so-and-so six weeks after baby, oh like Heidi Klum looking perfect. I'm like, I Fuck can't. you, bitch. Fuck like, you, I've already gained. You I'm like, problem. you are yeah, the problem. It's so frustrating because I'm like, problem. I mean, I've already accepted the fact that I'm going to be like enormous. I mean, I've already put on like almost 12 pounds and I'm only like 15 weeks. A lot of this water. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, that, water. that is a huge 
that is a huge fear for me. And actually along those lines too, it's so weird because I look in the mirror and obviously I see my stomach growing and I still, because I've been so, you know, critical of myself and my body my whole life. I think also, especially working in the industry too, where I shoot like perfectly naked, beautiful women probably doesn't help all that much. (laughs) So, um, so when I look at myself in the mirror and I see my belly growing, I still can't get rid of that thought that, oh, you're getting fat. You're getting fat. Look at you. You're fat. You're fat. Like it's so, and it's like, no, it's a baby. And it wasn't until I got my ultrasound and I saw a child in there that it, like that I almost kind of got it because even though I knew I was pregnant, I had all the signs, the test said, yes, I still like couldn't make that connection. I just felt like I was getting fat, but I still struggle with that so much. I think you have, I think it's bullshit if you don't, you know, I think yeah. people are lying who said that they aren't. Um, I was, I was a fat kid. I have so much body dysmorphia and like, um, I just, I seem, I look in the mirror, I can be my fucking thinnest and I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, I'm a size, whatever. You know, like I, I just, there is not a day goes by where I don't think about my weight and how I look and all of those things. And being pregnant was horrifying. Like being yeah. pregnant, like I do not have a picture of me pregnant. I was pregnant for 18 months of my life and I do not have a picture of myself. Like I just couldn't do it. Um, which is sad. Like I should have been able to like love my, but I just don't, I I just, it doesn't work for me. This whole concept of like, love your body and you're glowing and you're this. No, I was a horse. I sweat. I was not glowing. Like it was just disgusting. I got fat in places. I didn't even know. Like I was not a cute pregnant lady. I was not a basketball. Like I just, And you know how, like, it was so horrible. Do you know how people say, like, if you're a basketball, you're having a boy, but if you, like, spread out, you're having a girl? Have you ever heard that wives tale? No, I haven't. I've heard, like, if you carry high, it's one, and if you carry low, it's the other. Okay, so, like, essentially the same thing, except this is so misogynistic that, like, you basically are ugly if you're carrying a girl, and you're, like, adorable if you're carrying a boy. Oh, God. It's, like, so misogynistic. But yeah, for my – I didn't know what I was having with both of my pregnancies, and – on my both pregnancies, everyone was like, it's a girl. It's totally a girl. And so in your head, you're thinking like, like, that means I'm ugly ugly and fat. (laughs) Go fuck yourselves. Um, And that's why losing weight was a huge part of my recovery. Like Mm. a huge part because I needed to not feel that way anymore. I needed to not I identified the weight with unhappiness, Mm -hmm. you know, and I needed Mm -hmm. to break that up. You know, I, that it's interesting that you say that because I see so much of this. I almost wonder if we should sometimes recognize that for some people, like having a certain weight is really just what's going to get you to the point where you're going to be happy with yourself. And obviously we we're talking about like a reasonable weight, you know, yeah, of um, course. not something overly skinny, but you know, there's, there's all this push out there because there are heavier women who are getting a lot more press and, and, you know, they're saying like, I love my body the way it is. I love my body the way it is, which is amazing. You know, amazing. like I admire those women so much. There's this, uh, this performer in our industry named Carla Lane, who's a BBW performer and she is so confident and she loves her body and she's just like, and I envy her so much. Envy women like that. I'm like, can I drink some of what you are, the Kool-Aid? It's it's so funny, right? It's like I envy the skinny women with the perfect bodies and then I envy the large women who love their bodies. We're fucked either way. We're basically fucked either way. Right. So I think – I think for someone like me, because it sounds like that's what it's like for you, like I need to be like a certain healthy weight in order yeah. for me to feel good about myself. I don't know if I will ever have that mental fortitude to accept and love myself as like a bigger size. So how I, did you make that journey to for that weight loss and how did that change things for you? And, and can you kind of tell me a little bit about yeah, your journey that got you to the place where you are now? I... I went to see a nutritionist 
who in all honesty is like a militant commander. She's like, no, this is not like your LA, like let's eat oat milk and, you know, put tea, you know, whatever. Yeah. In your, in your coffee, like that's not what this was. This was like, this is how many calories you can eat. Don't mess it up. And so I wound up and I'd never really lived my life that way. And so I wound up eating as many calories as she told me. And I wound up losing weight. And I actually wound up losing more weight than I had ever. I think I was like maybe even thinner than my wedding. Um, And now when I look back at pictures of myself, I'm like, damn, she was skinny. I was skinny. And then it just wasn't sustainable. Like what you were saying before, like that's just not, it wasn't a sustainable weight. And so, you know, I've had to sort of play with it of like, I'm a mom. I need to drink. It's very important to my mental health (laughs) to cocktail all the time. Um, So like, how do I reconcile those things so that I can, you know, indulge and get that like, you know, dopamine hit or whatever the chemical release is from like chocolate and food and alcohol and also maintain myself as a certain way. So I, Mm. I fluctuate. I mean, I fluctuate between like 10 pounds, but um, you know, I dream of the day when I can give myself body grace. I dream Mm. of the day. And I have a daughter. So like I am so conscious about not speaking negatively about myself in front of her, even though I think it, I will never Mm. do it. And um, the only thing I can say, and my mom did, and it's not her fault and she did the best she could and like blah, blah, blah. It was also a different time back then. I think, uh, you know, only now we've come to realize like how important um, loving ourselves as we are is and the messages that we send our children. Yeah, and how detrimental they can be. Like how one comment can like fuck your whole life. And so, Mm. you know, my daughter, who's not a skinny mini, um, is the most confident badass girl ever. And I'm Mm. like, well, at least I'm doing something right there. You know, like at least Mm. I'm like breaking the cycle on her. Um, But I did this whole piece on, um, I I wrote this whole piece and I've done a podcast on it about my C, I had a C-section, I had two, Mm -hmm. and uh, my C-section scar. And, you know, there's this whole movement about love your scars, they're your badges of honor, you know, and I believe that. It's just, I don't really believe it for myself. You know, like I can feel those two things at the same time because every time I look at my C-section scar, I feel like a mother. Mm. And most of the time when I see it, it's like in a sexual capacity, right? Like I'm naked or whatever. And that's the last place I want to feel like a mom. That's the last place I want to be reminded of my mothering, you know? Mm -hmm. And so every time I look at it, I know I'm supposed to look at it and go like, oh, my angels came from there and how blessed I am. And I am. Like there's all this apology that goes with it, motherhood, right? Like there's Mm -hmm. just all this apology. And so like I am, but when I look at it, I hate it. I fucking hate it. It creates Mm -hmm. like a Grand Canyon on my stomach where like the pooch is there. Even if I do 85 planks, like it's always going to be there. I hate it. And that's just like, it's shitty. Our bodies change. Like, and and I want to get to a place of grace and self-acceptance, but- it's hard. That's a lot of mental work. A lot of mental you know, work. Yeah. It's funny. It's like, I feel, uh, and, and I don't know, maybe this is this perpetual guilt that like we always feel for not achieving like what we should be achieving. It's like the guilt that you feel for not achieving like that perfect post baby body, oh. but then also the, it's a new kind of guilt, a new guilt for not loving yourself the way you are and seeing your C-section as right. your badge of honor. And it's like, it's, it's just so like confusing. we can never do it's anything like right. Yeah. In, you know, and it's right. like, it's so frustrating. It is so frustrating. I, it drives me insane. And that's why I talk about it. Cause I'm mm. like, this is unpopular. I hate my C-section scar. This is very unpopular to say this, <laughs> but I hate yeah. it. Because yeah. you know what? I, when I did that, when I put it out there and when I did my podcast, I got so many responses from women mm-hmm. being like, thank you for saying that. I fucking hate mine too. But I was like too scared to say it because people would say I'm like, you know, not grateful. And I was like, yeah, exactly. Right. You know? And I see myself as like the person who says what we all think, but are too afraid to say, you know, I'm the one who can make yogurt right. sexual. And I am the one who can talk about cock rings at mommy and me. And I'm the one who can say the stuff that we're all scared to say. All right. So I'm a new mother. Let's just, let's say that I've, I've had my child 
And uh, it's been, you know, a couple months. I've gotten through like the first initial months of, you know, having a baby and all of the drama that comes with that. I've heard horror stories from so many girlfriends, which has made me absolutely terrified. But yeah, uh, we'll just I hear that. you. <laughs> Yeah, that goes. Uh, and I'm just feeling really unsexy. Um, I don't want to have sex with my husband. My husband doesn't appear to want to have sex with me. The only thing that we ever do is talk about the kids. I feel sluggish. I feel lumpy. Um, what would be maybe some of the initial steps that, or advice that you would give a new mother coming to you who really wants to start to change her life and how she feels about herself? I, before I answer that question, I just need to talk about the word lumpy and how no one has ever used that word to describe like new motherhood, but it is so perfect. Like that is, <laughs> I'm feeling it like lumpy. Yes. You feel your body feels lumpy. That is like so perfect. I love it. Um, well, I really talk about a couple of very um, easy ways that you can sort of re-harness your sexiness. Um some of them are popular, some of them are unpopular, but they are all really easy and they don't take a lot of time, which is what a new mom needs. So the first thing I tell moms is please just try to pull your shit together visually 20% of your week. Just 20. Okay. 20%. Look, okay. Look, look like garbage 80% of the time. But 20 Mom drop off, you can still look homeless. Totally. Like totally. <laughs> But two times a week, it can even be for two hours. I don't care. Put on some mascara, deodorant, and a shirt that makes you feel good. And maybe the lipstick you used to buy. And find a really cute way to wear dirty hair. But like pull it together two times just so you can feel human, right? Mm -hmm. It will have a huge effect on yourself. Um Actually, coronavirus time is like like that, right? Like I've been feeling so disgusting and so gross because I'm like home all the time and I don't put makeup on. And then, you know, today I put makeup on and then I'm Jewish. So we celebrated Passover and I got dressed up and I was like, huh, I felt like Batman had like gotten back into his like costume. You know, I was like, oh, she's back. This is amazing, you know? And um, so I tell women to do that. I think it's really, really important. Make that effort. The second thing I will say is you have to initiate flirting with your husband. You just have to. And frankly, I think you should flirt with everyone. Now, I'm not saying you should go out and have extracurricular activities if that's not in your agreement. But what I mean by that is sexiness is just energy. It's just mm. good, confident energy. And if you can get yourself together 20% of the time, and if you can do that when you're out, like just smile at that Starbucks guy, like just a dad, like mm -hmm. be like, Hey, like it's just energy that you can then take back home and then apply to your partner. Right. And sexy mm -hmm. texting is so fucking easy. I mean, you can have a kid attached to your boob and send a really sexy, racy text to your partner. Like that doesn't, that's not a lot of effort, but it mm. has a huge payoff. You know, it like, even if you can't be physically intimate, you're becoming sexually intimate in a non-physical way, right? Like you're, you're having that connection again. And like I said about energy, he's going to give you, or she's going to give you the feedback back. And that's going to feel really good. And that's going to sort of get your flames going again and be like, oh, right. I'm, I can do this. I can be sexy and breastfeed <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. So that's one thing I would say. And then the other thing I would say is that, um, and this is where women don't like me very much, but I do think that women should try, even when you're postpartum, to wear something sexy in the bedroom. And here's mm. why. Men's, um, men's arousal, and you probably know this, is tied to physical, um, sorry, visual stimulation. It's how they're wired. It's biological, yep. right? Yep. Why they love the porn stars, right? Because yeah. they like look perfect and perky and you know, all of those things. That's how they get off. That's what turns them on. And when you walk into a room wearing something sexy, it could just be a nice bra and underwear. Like, I'm not saying you have to like get all the straps out, it could just be a nice bra and underwear. He lit his face, like in his eye, it's the Snapchat filter. 
like the Instagram mm-hmm. filter where it's like, blah, 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 blah. like all yeah. of a sudden you've got no flaws. He does not see the milk stain. He does not see your C-section scar. He doesn't even know what back fat is. Ask him. He has no idea. Like he just sees a beautiful woman in front of him who wants to have sex. And he's mm-hmm. like, yes, yes. And so what I say to women is like, enjoy that. Like take that in. Believe him when he admires you and when he desires you believe him because there's nothing better than being desired yeah and i think that's a hard thing for women too you know we're self self self-critical because yes yeah even when my husband will say to me like oh you look really nice he's like of no, course. I no, I like, don't. I don't see you. this. And then like, I, oh my god! They're just like, well, why should I pay you a compliment if you just like shut me down every time? Exactly, exactly. And my husband will even say to me sometimes, like, "Well, isn't it nice that I like your body so much? Like, wouldn't you like me to? Uh, wouldn't you prefer me to like your body so much? Like, would you yeah. prefer me yeah. not to? Because always, I'm always like, no, you know, whatever. And uh, I'm like, yeah, but I want to love my body. It's hard to believe you. It's hard to believe mm-hmm. you. And so mm-hmm. I have to practice the same thing I preach, right? Like I have to right. remind myself to do that. And it it just – so I'll put on lingerie one night and I'll be like, oh, okay. Like he thinks I'm the hottest thing ever. And it's so important to do that when you feel like crap, right? Like mm. when you feel like you're too big or you feel like you're that. He's going to love you anyway. If he's not a right. dick, if he doesn't, he's an asshole. You know, right. so like he's just psyched you're there and put and, and putting in effort. That actually mm. means something to him, and he will give it back to you. So those right. are like the three things. And by the way, that doesn't take a lot of effort either. I mean, to find like a matching bra and underwear set is like that literally took you 15 seconds to put on, or a teddy, mm-hmm. or baby mm-hmm. doll. Baby dolls are the best because they hide everything. Baby dolls yeah. are like a postpartum's best friend. Your boobs are going to be huge. <laughs> it hides all this crap. Baby dolls are the way to go. It's so funny because my husband and I had like a sexy romantic night in a hotel room that we've been doing. This was before the quarantine. We would try to do like a date night where we'd like get like a nice hotel room and just get away for one night. Yeah. It yeah. Just like when you take yourself out of the environment of your totally. home, there's something very different about it. And I went and I bought some lingerie and I bought myself like a baby doll and I was already starting to show and he was like, he was just laughing. He was like, you totally look like, like a hot mom. Like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he meant it in like a good way. Cause yeah. it was a very like mom, yeah. you know, I kind mean, of outfit. We have to face reality. And that's yeah. what I think is really important in these conversation is like, could we just be realistic? Because Us mm. Weekly and that whole thing, it's not realistic. It's not. And so I want to be honest. This sucks. Yeah. You feel like shit. You've got three minutes. Like, let's just be real about this thing. Like, you are a mom. You are. <laughs> like, what else are you going to do? You know? Yeah. Um, you can't change what you can't change, right? But I think um, I think society is getting better about it. I think that we're becoming more accepting. I hope I am, like, part of that, um, you know, first brigade that's getting out there. And um, I think it's really important to have the conversations because every mom I know, once the conversation gets opened, goes, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only one. And you're like, you are so not the only one. Like there, we're all here. (laughs) You got an army behind you of people who feel like this, you know? Right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Brooke. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I really do think that that honesty angle is so helpful because, you know, we talked about so many different things about the guilt about not feeling this, looking this way, but then not feeling this way. And um, yeah, I just find it really helpful. And, and I can imagine that you're getting so much feedback from people who are like, finally, you know, we've got somebody who's being honest. And if I, you know, And I think a lot of it is about allowing yourself to feel those feelings that may not be feelings you're proud of. Yeah. Allowing yourself to feel shitty, allowing yourself to not feel good about yourself and recognizing that's okay and that's normal and it's something you can move past. Yeah, for sure. Name it. It's funny. Like in the elementary schools this year when there was school, um, they had a whole like social um, 
feeling unit, like school wide. And one of the big hallmarks of it was name your feeling right? Like they Mm. they say, name your feeling. And then this is how you can mitigate it. And I think that that's so important that we need to name our feelings because we're just told to be like happy all the time. Right. (laughs) So I think for moms, especially it's really important to name your feeling because once you do, you can, you can fix it. Mm -hmm. Once you say it, you can fix it. I have no libido. I feel unsexy. Okay. How can we fix that? What can right. we now do? You know? Right. Um, yeah. Cause you can't you know, solve the problem until you address it and identify until you name it. it, like name it and then right. we can solve it. So yeah, that's, that's what I think for sure. Fantastic. Um, so can you let everybody know, plug all your pluggables, where can they find you? Tell us about your podcast, all that totes. good stuff. Totes, totes, totes. So you can find me on Instagram at, um, at the sexy as a mother. Um, you can find my podcast, all the podcast places, sexy as a mother. It's really fun. It's really honest. Um, I am very self deprecating. You'll love it. And then my online store is at lovingsex.com backslash S-A-A-M, stands for sexy as a mother. And that's where I have like a very right and tight curated collection of the toys I think fit motherhood really well. So it's not 18,000 toys, it's probably 35. Um, And so if I have it up there, you can have total confidence that I think it's awesome and that I think it's going to work. And I always tell people, if you have questions, if you don't know, because so many women don't, you know, like they don't know what to do. Um, you could always DM me on Instagram. I'm It's a DM fest on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and my website is saamofficial.com, stands for sexyasamother.com. So those are all the places. Those are all my places. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brooke. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for and having me. And you guys me. can find me um, at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Support the show by going to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys for bearing with us um, and all my technical snafus during this quarantine time. I know a lot of my video didn't work. So um, we're going to be seeing a lot of Brooke, but that's okay. She's so <laughs> I put makeup on today. (laughs) You did. And that's a good thing because it's probably going to be like 80% of your footage. (laughs) Why did I even bother? (laughs) Thank you guys so much. And thank you for your support. And I'll see you next week. Bye.